Hello everyone, my name is Nick Hopwood. I'm from the University of Technology, Sydney in Australia, and this is a short video about abstracts. I'm thinking particularly about abstracts written for academic journal articles, but some of the ideas will apply to other kinds of abstracts too. Uh, for example, abstracts written for book chapters. Um, I'm gonna make a case that abstracts are really, really important and really, really hard to get right. And I will be an, in a great, huge club of people who look at the abstracts I've written and think that could have been better. Just let me share my screen with you now. So why abstracts matter and why they're really, really hard to write well. Here's an uncomfortable truth, I think. If you find writing abstracts easy, you can't be writing good abstracts. Um, and for ages, I kind of treated abstracts as like an afterthought. I got my whole paper written. I was like, that's the important thing. Oh, no, you know, kind of, oh, I'll just get the abstract blasted out. How many words does the journal let me have? Is there any structure? Fine, fine, fine. Maybe copy and paste some sentences from it. I realized that is not serving my needs well. If I'm writing good abstracts, I have to be finding it hard. I have to be agonizing over sentences and words and all sorts of aspects of abstracts. Why should you care about an abstract? Well, if we're talking about journal abstracts, everyone with internet access can read your abstract. At the moment, with many journal articles behind firewalls, sometimes you'd have to log in through a university library or something like that if you're lucky, but not everybody can read the whole version of a paper in many cases. But everybody without any kind of hassle can read the abstract. Huge audience, the biggest audience for any part of your work, I would argue. And it may be all that somebody reads of your work or a particular aspect of it. I would think to yourself, you know, if we're in a room together, I'd say, put your hand up if you've cited something and only read the abstract. And I would be putting my hand up. Of course, we wouldn't necessarily cite key things only based on the abstract. But maybe if we've got a sentence where we're saying, you know, kind of several people have taken this approach and we're not really that interested or leaning on their findings or something, we might just be, that's quite legitimate and authentic to say we may have only read the abstract. There's an economy of time, how are we going to spend it? I've made other videos about how we kind of choose to read and what not to read and how to read and things like that. Um, so yeah, people can just read your abstract. That might be the only chance you get with them to make your impression, to leave them with a lasting thought about you and your work. And if it's done well, they might even still be able to cite you and your H index and your citations will be going up based on your abstract alone. Abstracts also really affect the search results. Long gone are the days when we used to kind of either subscribe to hard copy journals, or what I used to do is go to the library and look for the latest issue of like the 10 journals that I read regularly and be really intimidated by all the professors who had you know, shelves and shelves and shelves of journals. We now have most things digitized. And so the, the accidental reader is much more likely and much more important than they used to be. People aren't necessarily finding our work because, or reading our work, because they read the journal that it's in. There are all sorts of other pathways they get to our work, and the abstract is key to these. I've tried to find, if I'm doing searching for literature, if I don't include the abstract and I just look at the title and keywords, I get rather too narrow results. I miss out things that might be important. If I go to the other extreme and include the whole text, oh, you get far too many. It's not a discerning enough thing. But including the abstract in the search is something that I find really, really helps. You often get that kind of the sweet spot between inclusion and precision. So what you put in your abstract is really going to affect who even finds your work. And then if you write it well, they might kind of read the whole abstract and then they might even cite you. Of course, abstract is also a really influential text, not only once your article is published, but influencing even if it gets published at all or in which journal it might get published. An abstract will influence the editor hugely. That's their first point of contact with a prospective author and a possible paper or manuscript for their journal. And based on an abstract alone, we might make decisions, I'm an editor, we make decisions about the relevance of papers very, very quickly based on the abstract. And a lot of our desk rejects will be based on a provisional decision made on reading the abstract and then a scan through the rest of the paper, particularly those ones that are kind of quite far out of relevance for our 
field. Uh, we make an early impression and then kind of we just need to check in the whole paper. But also we'll kind of, we'll read abstracts and we'll be immediately getting a thought of, huh, you know, who might be reviewing this? Is there a contribution here? It hugely affects our impressions. And then of course, if we do send it for review, we, read, we tend to read the paper in more detail, but not completely. And um, we often also use the references to think about who we might be asking to review it. So then the abstract gets passed on to who? Potential reviewers. And if I'm a reviewer and I'm asked, I get these emails about once a week, and somebody says, please, Nick, will you read, uh, uh, review this paper for us? What do I get? I get the title and I get the abstract. And based on that abstract, I make a decision whether to give up my free time instead of watching Lego Masters or Game of Thrones or whatever it might be that I like to do in my spare time. And instead, I go read this article. Now, I try and keep myself review neutral. Every time I receive a review, I owe one back. But I'm flooded with requests. So I don't need to say yes just to get my kind of, you know, review re re bank account back into, um, you know, into the black, into positive and have more reviews that I've done than I owe back. But... So I'm therefore thinking, well, which ones will I review? And how do I make that decision? Largely based on the abstract. Sometimes it's to do with the timing and what else I've got going on. And then I might have, so writing an abstract that sends the right signals might help the right people say yes to your review. You really want to be reviewed by people who are interested in your work, keen on what you have to do, singing from your song sheet. And you know, kind of those are the people who um, the editors will be contacting first. It's like people who they think are relevant and interested. Um, and if your abstract is off-putting and boring, more and more reviewers are going to say no. And then you get long, lower and lower and lower down the editor's list of who might be any good to review this. And you don't want to get really far down that list because then you're going to get like a reviewer who's way out of kind of the ideal person from your or the editor's perspective. It also influences a review because then once they've said yes, it's set up their expectations. And if I'm a reviewer and I'm giving up my free time because I'm not paid to do this, nobody is, um, and I've said, yes, I'll review that because that abstract looks really interesting and I'm thinking I might get something from that and I probably would have read the paper anyway if it had been published. And I sit there and it, the, the paper does not deliver on what the abstract has promised. I get really grumpy and things where I might have been more gentle or say minor revisions, I maybe go to major or if I were going to say major, I maybe suggest a reject. So managing the reviewer's expectations is crucial and a lot of that happens through the abstract. Finally, you should care about your abstract and abstracts matter because it persuades people maybe to read your whole paper. They might be lucky and have a library that can give them access to it. It might be open access or they might need to go and ask you, you know, email you or look for a, um, an, an institutional repository for it. But the idea is, boom, that's kind of the ultimate win for you is somebody's interested enough in your work that they want to read the whole of your paper. Now, I agree with Pat Thompson and Barbara Kamler. My whole understanding of abstracts and the effort I put into writing abstracts changed completely after um, Barbara Kamler came to where I was working at UTS and kind of uh, persuaded me that I needed to think differently about abstracts. They say that abstracts are tiny texts. What they mean by that is like they're like a genre of their own. We have the genre of the journal article. We have the genre of the book chapter, the genre of the thesis. There are other genres, newspaper articles, fiction books, poems, right? Abstracts are their own genre. They're not just cutting and pasting highlights from a bigger text. That's a hugely important idea. This means they have their own logics. And you know, they've said, you know, good papers have a good abstract behind them. I absolutely agree. I also think that good papers have good abstracts ahead of them or in front of them. And what I mean by that is that you can use abstract writing to really help shape your paper, the introduction, how you make people care about it, how you give a coherent single thread flowing through this. If you can get that done in your abstract, you can get it done in your paper. Um, and it really, really helps. So I think good papers have good abstracts behind and in front of them. Now, Here's a few things. Why are abstracts so hard? I've said abstracts are important. I also promised in this video that I'd make a case that they're really, really hard. Yes, they are high stakes and they are difficult because they have to be, well, they're short, but they have to communicate a lot, which means they kind of got to be dense in the messaging that they offer. But we want them to be easy and clear for readers. So how do you combine density of communication 
with ease and clarity. No easy answers. They have to capture your argument. You can't be cited unless there's something that new that you're saying that nobody's said before, and that has to be contained in your abstract. They also have to make your work sound important and distinctive. You can't just communicate your, your findings or whatever it might be, or your argument. You have to kind of make it seem different and important um, and worth of paying attention, particularly if you're going to you know, try and persuade people to read on and read the whole of your paper. Um, so how do you do that in such a short space of time in this very tight word economy? Not only that, if you've got to describe your findings and make them sound important and novel, you've got to make people think that they're worth believing, that your methods were robust enough, that your techniques, your experiments or your analysis or whatever, your data collection, whatever it was, your concept, conceptual framework, that what you have to say is not only clear and then important and different for anybody else is saying, but like robust, it stands up, it holds, that people should believe you. That's hugely difficult. That's another message you've got to convey. And you're doing this whole kind of expectation management thing of what are people going to get later in the paper. That's a heavy burden to place on, what, 150, 200 words often. Now, what I, I love the idea here, I haven't got a slide for it, um, is this man, semantic wave that what happens is there are kind of, we can think of text going between two different poles, if you like. At one side, you've got the general and the abstract. And the other side, you've got the concrete and the specific, the other pole. And abstracts are rarely all in one. Abstracts can't all be about the general and the abstract. You've got to be talking about some specifics to do to your study. But they can't also be totally buried in the concrete specificities of your study. Otherwise, what are the wider lessons? What conversation is this part of? What knowledge is this advancing? What field or debate is this joining or you know, kind of assumptions this is disrupting, all that kind of thing. So we have to have both of these, the general and abstract parts and the concrete and the specific part. Now, what we cannot have is a, like a really rough move between those two. The idea of the semantic wave is a nice seamless flow between general and abstract and concrete and specific so that the reader isn't finding it kind of like a jarring thing and they go, well, hang on a minute, how did you get from the general and abstract issue, say, of you know, curing cancer to what you're doing looking at cell growth in this particular you know, kind of material. We need to have smooth, logical flow between them so that the reader doesn't really notice that their impression of what you're doing concretely and specifically is completely tied to that general and abstract issue that they care about. So you've got to ride the semantic wave. That's a kind of the, the theoretical answer to how you achieve clarity, um, with dense texting, or at least part of dense text, or at least part of the answer. But there's all sorts of other things that are going uh, go into that, which I won't talk about today. Now, here's some little things from me. This is not um, Barbara Kamler and Pat Thompson talking here, this is me. When you don't have many words, I think you really need to focus on what you have done, why it's original, important, and of high quality, not what other people have done. So I'm saying, in the tight word economy of the abstract, there is no space at all for a sentence that says X, Y, and Z have shown that, or previous research has shown that. Okay, with or without citations, I'm not a particular fan of citations in abstracts, and most of them I read don't have them. The problem is, is really that if a sentence is entirely about other people, it's saying nothing about your work. And every sentence should say something about your work in an abstract. All that work it's got to do in terms of you know, promoting your work, setting up expectations, making it sound original, distinctive, important, believable, all those kind of things. You don't have time, surely, or space, word-wise, for a sentence that says nothing about your work. Now, I'm not saying you never refer to other work or existing work. Often it makes sense to do so, but you might say, this paper builds on evidence that. Or you might put it in the first person if you're in one of those fields where that goes, you know, kind of, I build on prior research showing, or you know, we do this. But the point is, the subject of that sentence is the paper, the work, the study, the authors, what's happening. There's a verb there, you know, kind of builds on. The verb attaches to the study, the authors, what the paper is offering, not to what other people have done. So I think it's really, really important in terms of how you make the most of that tight word economy. Now, as an editor, I read lots and lots of abstracts, and as somebody who gets asked to review almost daily, um, you know, I read them as well. <sighs> Findings will be discussed, presented, and implications discussed. 
I'm even beyond just saying yawn to that. I'm like, that's just totally vacuous. Doesn't tell me anything. Of course, findings will be presented and implications discussed. What are the findings? What are the implications? If I read something like that, and that's kind of a stark example, but you know what I mean. I can't cite you. I'm not interested in reading the whole paper because I don't know what the findings are like. I, they might be completely dull, boring. <laughs> no. And I get this next one all the time. Four themes are outlined or, you know, kind of um, interviews are analyzed in terms of four key categories or five, whatever. Which four? Please don't let me the end point of your analysis either. I mean, that's a slightly separate point, but I just, I, yeah, that's a slight beef I have with particularly interview studies which land up in four themes uh, or, you know, whatever it is. But you kind of, you know, if there are five categories, tell me what they are in the abstract, please. Then I might be able to cite you. Then I might be able to go, huh, three of those I expected, but two are really interesting. I need to read this whole paper. Then you start to win. So I can cite you and I'm going to read the whole paper. And then sometimes there is, and it's never said like this, but like at the bottom of the slide here, there's the implicit idea that, well, only those people who can actually be bothered or are lucky enough to have access to the full paper get to know what I really argue here. It's not like the trailer for a movie, okay, where you, people have to go buy the ticket to find out what happens or, you know, get the amazing twist at the end. No, I want to know what your argument is. What do you think we should do differently? What have you added to knowledge? Why is this important? What are you, you know, kind of, what are your implications? What would you like people to think differently? What would you like them to pay attention to that they weren't before? What have you confirmed experimentally or demonstrated as possible? We have to land in the abstract. And if you don't, I'm not going to be persuaded to read what you have to say. So I hope I've convinced you that abstracts are really, really worth thinking hard about. They are so important. They're not just a throwaway short text. They are what Pat and Barbara call a tiny text. They have their own logics, they are very, very particular demands placed on authors in writing good abstracts. I would suggest most of the abstracts I've written are not as good as they could be, certainly not as good as they should be, but I do think it's really worth spending time to think, how do we get our abstracts right? Uh, some of you might be joining me in a workshop where we're going to kind of look at abstracts and the, uh, uh, an approach to writing abstracts where I think we can deal with some of these tensions, but if you're not, please just have a think. Why, you know, what work is this abstract going to be doing for me? How can I really put my effort into it, perhaps even before I've written my paper, to think, how can I make this abstract help my thinking, help get a really nice coherent paper, help the editors think, yep, this is a good paper, help the reviewers go, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'm going to read that. And then set up their expectations, make a reader in 150 or 200 words think, huh, this person has something really interesting to say. I haven't seen that before. You know what? I think I could probably cite that, but even better, I'm going to read the whole thing. That's what we want, to do that in 200 words whilst also being easy to read and clear. That's hard. If we recognize the demands of abstract writing, we're one step closer to writing good abstracts. I hope you found this video useful. Uh, do have a look at my YouTube channel, uh, Nick Hop 1979 And yeah, please uh, comment below if you um, find any points particularly interesting, if you disagree with something, if you've got a really good example of an abstract you'd like to share. I'd love to hear from you. All right, bye-bye.